morning. Welcome. Good morning. I'm so glad that you're here with us this morning. If you are new with us today, I want to extend a very special welcome. We're so glad that you've joined us today. My name is Emily Nafis, and I am a home group leader with my husband, Frank, and I'm also one of the pastors on staff here at the Vineyard. And I'm just so glad you're here. I love to see your smiling faces, and I absolutely love the greeting time. It's so fun to see you saying hello to one another and just showing love to each other. So I'm so glad that you're here and excited, excited for what God has for us today. You heard um, Amos tell us that we're in a series right now called Love, Love, Love. And now I'm super thankful that the kind of love we are not talking about is this love like when I was 16. I had this really cute boyfriend. He was so cute. And that was about it. He was just cute. It wasn't Frank, I'm so glad. What are you? That you're mine. And I didn't marry this really cute 16-year-old boy. But it's not that kind of love. Not that kind of love that we're talking about. This morning we're going to look at two types of love. In the book of 1 John, that's what we're looking at. So Amos took us through 1 John 1 and 2, and this morning I have 1 John chapter 3. And throughout 1 John, the Apostle John goes in all of these circles around this idea of love. And there's two types that we're going to look at today. So as we journey through this morning, just keep your minds wrapped around these two types of love and two questions in particular. So we are going to look at loving others. And the question that I want you to frame in your mind is, how do we love others, especially when it's difficult? I know that none of you deal with difficult people, right? I mean, actually, I am a difficult person. You can ask Frank, so I know he has to deal with me. Um, but we all go through this in our lives, right? Where there's someone in our life that is just difficult, whether it's a friend that just drives you nuts, or a family member that you have to love because they're family, but really they drive you crazy. Or if it's a coworker that you have to work with, but they make you crazy. Or, and this is a tough one, maybe you live with someone with mental illness and it's not their fault. It's not their fault. And it's hard to be in a situation with someone that you love that is struggling with depression or struggling with some other type of mental illness. And that's not to say that it's not difficult. It is difficult. And so how do we love people when they're difficult on purpose and when they're difficult without meaning to be? We are still called to love them. And so the question today is how? And the Apostle John's going to give us some good answers to how do we do that? And then the second question is about loving God. We are called, we know, to love God and to love others. It's the most basic truth. It is Jesus' greatest commandment, love God, love others. But the question today about God's love is this. Yes, we're called to love him, but what does his love really look like? Do we really get it? Do we really understand the kind of love that God has for us? So we're going to look at those two things, and I'm actually, just to keep you awake, I'm going to swap them. Because I know it says love God and love others, but I'm going to save love God for the last, because it's the best part. So we're just going to switch it. So loving others and loving God. We're going to look at some answers to our questions by looking at 1 John chapter 3. So before we dig in to 1 John chapter 3, I have to give you some background. So I want you to take your imaginations way back in time, take your imagination way back to 75 AD or to 100 AD. So we're not exactly sure when 1 John was written, but the experts have given us that time frame. So we're in the first century AD. Now I'm not a history expert, maybe some of you are. Most of us are not experts in this time frame, but here's what's happening, Rome, is the world power, not the United States. We weren't even there. Well, we were there, but who knows who was there. Rome was in charge of everything, and their culture, it was one of instant gratification. Anything goes. Do whatever you want, whatever feels good, go for it. This was Rome's culture. 
they also did not worship one god. They worshiped many gods. And so most of us are familiar with Roman mythology, Greek mythology, so Zeus and Diana. These were gods and they built temples. So where John was writing was to Ephesus, and this is modern day Turkey. So the apostle John had left Israel and gone to Turkey where he set up a church, a group of people, a community of people. He told them all about Jesus and they formed this group of people that believed in Jesus. It was a church, they formed a church. And John was their pastor. And so he's writing a letter to that community of people that he had left in Ephesus. And in this community in Ephesus, there was a temple there to Diana, the goddess Diana. And the people outside in the world, they just, whatever goes. It was that kind of a culture. They also believed that a person could be a god. And so, for example, the um, Emperor Augustus, the Roman Senate gave him deification. They made him a god. They believed that a person could be a god, right? So this is kind of weird for us. We don't believe that. It's not part of our, our culture, but for them it was. So here is what happened. While John was with them, they had this constant reminder of who Jesus was because John knew Jesus. But the people living there, they didn't. So much time had passed. Most of them probably weren't alive when Jesus was alive. And they don't have this. There is no Bible. So they can't just open up the New Testament and read about who Jesus is, right? But they had John. So then what happens, however, is that as time passes, some of them start to lose the basics, right? These are the basics. And they started to just lose it. And some of them started to believe, wait a minute, Jesus couldn't have been human. He's a God. He couldn't have come as a human. And you've just lost some of your basics. Yes, he did come in human form. But some of them started to believe this. And when they started to believe that, then they thought, well, I can be a God. So I can't possibly sin. There's no sin. I can do whatever I want. There's no such thing as sin. And even if I did sin, oh, who cares, right? They lost the basics. And since they thought they couldn't sin, then they thought we don't have to follow any of the commandments. They did know the Old Testament commandments, those basic Ten Commandments and the commandment, love God, love others. They thought, eh, don't need it. I don't need those commandments. And so they were mean, they did not love others, and they were being so mean to the believers in that community who still stuck to the basics. So not all of them went off the deep end. Some of them stayed. And they had to deal with these difficult people, right? People that they had loved, people that were part of their family and their community went kind of crazy, I call them crazy. And and they were being mean. And so here's what John's community is dealing with. And this is part of why John is addressing them. It's not the whole reason. But keep it in mind when you read 1 John that this is some of what's happening to them. And this is what John is trying to say. So John is saying to them, hey, look. Right? He doesn't want them to get confused and think that these people who left are right. They are not right, John is saying. They did not ever know God. If they can fall so far off that deep end, they were not believers in the first place. That is not following Jesus, what they're doing. So John's trying to set them straight, and he's trying to help them get back to the basics. Loving God, loving others, and he wants to encourage and uplift them. So that's part of what's going on here. So without further ado, let's dig into what John is actually saying. And we're going to focus first on this one. How do we deal with loving, difficult people? And keep in mind that this is what John's community of believers is dealing with right now. So we're going to turn to John chapter 3. We're going to go backwards. I know that sounds weird. We're not going to read it backwards like they do that in Hebrew, read left to right. We're just going to go from the end of 1 John 3 and then travel back to the beginning. But... 1 John chapter 3, if you have your Bibles with us, with you, you can open, or if you have your YouVersion Bible app, you can scroll with me. 1 John chapter 3, we're going to start at verse 16. If you don't have your Bibles with you, you can just listen. So here's what John is telling them. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ 
laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we know we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command. Believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Those who obey his commands live in him and he in them, and this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. So I think partly what John is doing is saying to this community, look, love God and love others, and this is how you'll know who's really in Christ. You'll see it by what comes out of you. You'll know them by their fruit if you love one another. And he's trying to help them distinguish. So how do we love others when it's difficult? He's asking them, he's calling them to such a deep level of love. The first thing he says is, be willing to lay down your life for someone. I don't know if you saw this story in the news. It was amazing. It happened during the Fort Lauderdale shooting, which was so tragic. But a story came out of a woman who was like 20 feet from the shooter and a man, and they didn't know each other. But the woman just quick dropped to the ground, and this man, who didn't know her, laid on top of her, and he said, I will protect you. And he didn't even know her. What kind of love is that? What kind of love is that? That is the love that Jesus has for us, and that's the kind of love John was calling them to. It's the kind of love Jesus calls us to, and that, I think, is the most difficult kind of love. Would you lay down your life for someone? That's hard. Would I lay down my life for someone I love? Very easily. But for someone who's difficult, I don't know if I could do that. But what John is saying is, this is love. Love for one another, no matter what the cost, no matter what it takes. We love one another as best we can. And he says, don't just do it with words. So these opponents of John, they were telling people that they loved them, but they weren't helping. They were doing nothing to help. And so what John is saying is, don't just love with words. Don't just say to people, oh, I love you. Sure, I'll pray for you. And then you don't do anything practical to help. But try, try to love one another, not just with words, but with actions, is what John is saying. So this morning, how do we love one another, especially when they're difficult? I just wanna give you a few practical tips. They don't necessarily come from John, more from my experience. But dealing with difficult people, it is hard. One way to do it, however, is to think about 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Amos talked about that last week. That's that chapter that they always read at the weddings. Love is patient, love is kind. And uh, what, what happened this week at Community Bible Study, I go to Community Bible Study, looking for Janet. It's so great. And they're actually studying love, believe it or not. So it helped me a lot. I was, it was Thursday when I went to CBS, and I didn't even have my sermon written. And it was awesome because they talked all about love. And what they suggested is, it's on the back of your bulletin. So if you grabbed a bulletin, what they recommended doing is taking this love passage, love is patient, love is kind, and putting a name in there. Now they suggested putting your name in, and that's a great thing to do. If you wanna feel deeper love of God, put your name in those blanks. But what I recommend you do is put the name of that difficult person in the blanks. So if Frank's having a really hard day with me, I'm just being like this because I am often like this and he's just, I'm gonna lose it with Emily, then he can put my name in here. Jesus is patient and kind with Emily. Jesus is not jealous or boastful when he relates with Emily. Now I did this uh, with someone in particular who I was having trouble with, and as soon as I was done, I just felt this peace. 
Jesus loves that person. He does. Loves everyone. And it just gave me a peace and a little more love for that person. So I'll throw that out for you. That's something that you can take home and do for the next few months or whatever as you deal with people who are difficult. But try to remember that Jesus loves them. I want to share a quick story, too. Something else that happened this week related to the Fort Lauderdale shooting. Um, I was really upset at the shooter. I don't know him, but in a, in a sense, I consider him an enemy, right? Who would do something so horrendous? And so I'm, I was having these bitter thoughts. And I got this email from the coordinator of our prayer ministry, Tracy. And in the email, she said, we should pray for him that he would have a Damascus Road experience. And what that means is, um, that's the story of Paul when he was persecuting Christians and then Jesus brings this flash of light and speaks directly to Paul. Paul, I am Jesus, follow me, basically. So she's basically asking us to pray that this man would come to know Jesus and change his life. And I was just floored. What kind of love is that? I wasn't being loving, having these bitter thoughts. So when it's difficult to love someone, pray for them. Think about how much God loves them as you deal with them. Love others. Let's talk about God's love. This is my favorite part. God's love. So what we're going to try to do this morning is answer this question. What is God's love really like? Do we really get it? What is his love really like? You know, maybe some of you have noticed as you live your life and as you go through it, my experience of God's love continues to grow and change and get deeper. And what that says to me is this, I don't know that I'll ever fully understand how much God loves us until I meet him face to face. But we can continue to grow in this love and continue to find and understand God's love deeper. And so my prayer for you this morning is that as we go through this part of loving God, that you will experience and feel his love in an even deeper way. Let's see what John has to say to his community about God's love. He's going to give us some great insights into what God's love is like. So we're going to turn backwards to 1 John. We're going to have to go a little bit back into chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. And we'll read down through chapter 3, verse 6. And you can just listen to. And now, dear children, continue in him. So that when he appears, and they're talking about Jesus, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he's righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. Now this is awesome. Listen close. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. I have to read that again. This is awesome. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. We'll stop there. That last part can be a little confusing, so I'll clarify that to you. He's talking about those people that I talked about earlier who went off the deep end and just thought they could sin, sin, sin all they want. So he's not talking about the common believer who, yes, we sin. I sin every day. But he's talking about a sin which is purposeful rebellion against God. That's not what we do every day, I hope. But purposeful rebellion against God. So don't get too afraid. The first time I read that, I was like, oh man, I'm not going to heaven because I sin constantly. That is not what he's saying. He's talking about this constant rebellion of people who don't know God. So 
What we see from this passage, I'm just going to pull out three insights about God's love that we can draw from this. The first one is where John talks about being a child of God. Now, just raise your hand if you have children. A show of hands. That's a lot. Okay. I do. So I didn't even raise my hand. <laughs> Sometimes I try to forget, but I do. <laughs> I do have children. And uh, I'll tell you a little story about my two children. So if you know them, you know I love them. I really love them. I have a five-year-old and a three-year-old. And I was talking on the phone, so this was my fault. I shouldn't have been chatting on the phone. I wasn't paying attention. And in the living room, Maggie had one of those yogurt pouches. I don't know if you know those. They have yogurt in them, right? And she is really wild. She is so funny. She's hilarious, but she's crazy. And so she was, I didn't know this, obviously, but she was taking yogurt and like squeezing it and jumping all over the house, right? And then, then she cajoled Zachary into doing it too. And he didn't need any cajoling because this is so fun. Who wouldn't want to squeeze yogurt and throw it all over your house? And so he did the same thing. And before I know it, obviously it was way too late, but I walk in the living room and just, what did you do? I totally lost it because if you know me, and some of you know me, I am OCD about my house. It has to be clean, has to be clean. Like inside the drawers, that can be a disaster. But the outside, when you look at my house, it must be clean. And if there's a speck of dirt, I'm, I grab the broom. I just can't handle it. So this was like a double whammy for me. I was so Mad, so mad, and I won't tell you what I did because you might call CYS or something, I don't know. <laughs> They're still alive, they had no bruises, it's okay. I, I, didn't, I didn't smack them, but anyway. The point of this story is, yes, I know, little kids, little problems, and they're going to grow up, and they're going to do so much worse than that. They're going to break my heart so much worse. I should actually really appreciate the yogurt mess, except that I'm still cleaning it out of the cracks of my hardwood floor. If you come over, you'll see it. There's still yogurt on the walls. I just can't get it out. Anyway, they're going to do worse. They're going to really sin. And I am going to love them. I'm going to love them anyway, no matter what they ever do. No matter what, I will never leave them. I will never abandon them, and I will never write them out of my will, not even for the yogurt disaster. I will love them always. So what I want to say is that even if you don't have children, if you do, I know you know what I'm talking about. It's that kind of love, that unconditional love. If you don't have children, think about the person you love the most. You'll never leave them. You'll never give up on them. That's the way John is saying that God loves us. He calls us his children. He'll never leave. He'll never give up on us. And no matter what we do, no matter what we did before, no matter what we do today, and no matter what we do the next day, he will never, never, never stop loving you. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, that you can do that is too far or too bad. You can never be too dirty. He will always clean you. He will always accept you. That's the kind of love God has for us. And I know you know that, but it's time to feel it. To feel truly loved and accepted. How else does God love us? What does John say? The second insight, he starts talking about um, heaven, basically. He doesn't say heaven, but he's talking about when we see Jesus face to face will be like him. So he's talking about heaven. And where I want to go with this is, I used to be really afraid of dying. I knew that I would go to heaven, but here's what I was afraid of. I was afraid of this part where it says, you're going to be judged. That terrified me. Because what I pictured was this, I'm going to get into this courtroom, and Jesus is going to lay out all my junk in front of everyone. I thought there'd be like this huge audience and everyone was going to see i can't believe she did that i thought she was perfect i can't believe she did that and it was just going to be horrendous so i have this huge fear um, and so when we get to heaven right it does say that we'll be judged um, and i don't know exactly what will happen but i do have an account of someone who died and went to heaven and came back to tell his story 
there are actually a lot of, not a lot, not a lot, at least a thousand accounts in this book, uh, particularly, of people who have died and gone to heaven. So this is not the Bible. Take it for whatever it's worth. It fascinates me, and I was really encouraged by what I read about a particular man. He was um, in boot camp, so he was a soldier, he was at boot camp, and the weather was horrendous, and he got double pneumonia, and he died. And uh, he was clinically dead, and then he did come back to life to share his story. But he shares this part of that moment of the judgment, right? And here's what he says, and this is awesome. So he sees Jesus, and he can't really describe it. It's this amazing, incredible light, like a light you've never, you can't experience, but this huge, bright light. And here's what he says about Jesus. It was an astonishing love, a love beyond my wildest imagining. This love knew every unlovable thing about me. He knew the quarrels with my stepmother, my explosive temper, the sex thoughts I could never control, every mean, selfish thought and action since the day I was born. But he loved and accepted me just the same. I read some more accounts of people who got to this judgment and every single one said this when they got to that place of being judged they felt nothing but absolute total love it was not a moment of shame it was a moment of hey i know your junk i knew your junk when you did your junk and i love you and i forgive you and it's over and it is hard to understand that kind of love because we don't often give it but that's the kind of love that our God gives. What else does our God do? How else does our God love? The third point that John brings up for us is that he takes away all of our sin. We sort of just touched on that part, but I want to think about it a little deeper. He takes away all of our sin. So here's the basics, right? We're talking about basics. We cannot save ourselves. Many of you here, I know you believe this. Don't tune out on me. Just remember your basics. But for those of you who haven't quite got it yet, those of you who aren't really sure, I don't know about this Jesus stuff, and those of you who are sitting there thinking she is wacky, I don't know what she's talking about, and I don't know about this God thing. You know, I'm fine on my own. I've got everything in control. I don't need this religious Jesus stuff. For those of you in that place, listen to me. You cannot save yourself. There is going to be a time when life is over and what then? Where will you go and what will happen? The answer is there's only one way to, Je to Jesus. There's only one way to heaven. That's through Jesus Christ, because he paid our price. So we can't get to heaven because we're sinful and God cannot handle sin. So in order to get to heaven, we have to be free of it. That's why Jesus came. He took our place. He said, you know what? Yes, you're guilty, but I'll pay your price. I'll take your punishment. You go. I've got it done. He takes away all of our sin. What kind of God is that he is an all-loving God. He is an all-loving God. And so this morning, as you leave today, as you go through your week, keep in mind what John encourages his people to do, what he encourages us to do, love others, sacrifice. You know, why is it that we have so much trouble loving others? And why is it that we have so much trouble really feeling God's love? I'll show you why. Me, 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 and we're so busy with ourselves looking in the mirror that we don't pay any attention to this. We're so busy in our own selfishness that we don't remember the basics. So my challenge for you this week, what I want to encourage you to do is try to get rid of yourself. I promise you, I promise you, you will be much happier when you are thinking of others, when you are giving to others. When you think about yourself, you're not going to get any happier. 
And when you get rid of yourself, you can let more of God's love in. And I also just pray, I just pray this week and the rest of this year, whatever, that you just can feel the sense of God's love. And so this morning, I do believe, I truly believe that Jesus just wants to wash his love over us. And so we're just going to take some time to rest in God's love. And so what I'd like to do is have the worship team come on up. I'm going to move this out of the way. The worship team is going to come up. And what we're going to do is I'm going to pray for us, and I'm going to read a particular passage. It's from Micah. I'm going to read that to you, and then we're going to let the worship team do their thing. And while they're worshiping, if you want to stand, it's fine, but I would encourage you to just sit, maybe even like this, and just try really hard to feel God's love. If you can just sit there and say Jesus' name over and over, just try, just see if you can try a little harder to sense God's love a little deeper. And then when the worship song is over, I'll come back. But I also want to say one more thing. During this worship time, I'm going to be back in that back corner, the left-hand corner. And if you are here today and you just have this feeling in your stomach like, I want to know Jesus, it's time. It is time for me to stop being selfish Stop thinking that I'm in control, and I want this love of Jesus. If today is the day that you want to make the best decision of your life, if you want to meet me in that back corner, I would love to pray with you. And if you just have questions, if you think I'm crazy and you want me to explain it better, I will do it so you can meet me in that back corner during worship. So for now, everyone, just close your eyes for a moment. Holy Spirit, come. Sweet Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit. Micah chapter 7. Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? Lord God, you do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. Come, Holy Spirit. So, God, I just pray right now. Lord Jesus, would you wash your love over everyone in this room, over the cafe and over the kids' wing. Lord Jesus, come wash your love over us. I pray you take us deeper today. Take us deeper. Help us to understand how much you love us.